Praise the Lord, I'm Thomas Manton IV. I'm going to be speaking about something very profound. And I'm going to do this all in one message because I don't want to, you know, stop and say, well, you know, we'll pick it up next time. Because when God drops an atomic revelation like he has on me today, I got to cover it in one shot. Last, <laughs> last Sunday we went two hours and 27 minutes, something like that, on divine formulas for financial abundance. I am not speaking about that today. I'm on a completely different topic. And to me, uh, this is a, a message that's been years in the making. This is not a uh, light thing, a small thing, or an elementary thing. And you're going to be blessed. Uh, call everybody. Send them a note. Call them on the phone. Take this link URL. Figure out how to do that. Forward it to other people. And share this uh, because God is gonna is gonna really drop some weighty weighty revelation here today. Uh, two nights ago, I think it was Friday night or Thursday night. Two or three nights ago, I first had the glimpse of this thought uh, of the title I'm going to give you in just a just a moment, and then. I had two or three thoughts, and then I just left it because I was busy. You know, when, when, when God's about to have me deliver it, he'll have me pick it up. So this morning, <laughs> I was really in a realm of, I don't know, processing a lot of things prophetically. It was, it was amazing. And all of a sudden, it just came right back to me when I just... But, even before I had the thought of what would I speak about today, it just came in, just like, just like that, very quick. Wow. And uh, <laughs> here we go. All right, let me give you the title. Are you ready? I don't know if you're ready, but let's go. There used to be a group of uh, comedy actors called the Not Ready for Primetime Players. If you're not ready for prime time, I want to help you get ready for it. But there are some people that are ready. And why would God speak this if, it, if, he, if there wasn't a vision? Sometimes what's spoken is a prophetic vision for a development process that you're going to go through. And I'm going to share. And this is the title. Can you believe it? Since this morning, I was running around a bit today and doing many things. And, and as I was going through the day, God was speaking to me point by point. Nobody knew God was talking to me because I didn't even tell anybody. That's one sign of maturity. Uh, you don't have to just go off and on about what, what, you know, I'm hearing from God right now and he's telling me this. You know, it's you, just like you get to a point, you, you, you're so in the flow, you don't even have to talk about it. And then when God does speak something to do, like the Apostle Paul said, I conferred not with flesh and blood. I didn't debate or argue or ask permission to do what God told me to do. And I found out this principle, in a little introduction here, I found out this principle, it's better to say I'm sorry than to ask for permission. Why? Because sometimes if you ask for permission, what if someone says no? And then if they say no, then if you crash the door down, you know, you're, you're like, you're wrong because they said don't do it. But if they didn't tell you to do it, and you do it, you go, you know what? I meant, well, I'm sorry, but you already got in. <laughs> somebody, said, somebody said this, uh, a friend of mine, uh, who is a very high senior security uh, authority in the government, in, in the nation. And uh, he sent me a, a seed, and I just called him back to thank him. And I said, when have we met? He said, sir, we've never met. He said, I've been following your ministry and I'm so amazed, and I saw you with the Archbishop, and I was like, wow. And he said, I'm so humbled and honored that you would call me. I said, of course, I want to call you and thank you and talk to you and know you, and uh, thank you for your partnership. So we talked for a long time, but he had, I, I think it was him, because I processed so many calls in a day, but he, he had a thing written on there like, um, divine opportunity 
can present itself. God can have it presented to you, but it's you who get it by crashing the door down. <laughs> by going and making it happen. Let me say it in a simpler way. God gives his favor for, for divine opportunity for you, but it's you that makes it happen. He's not going to come down off his throne in heaven. He couldn't walk on the earth. Everybody would die. His presence is so holy, a sinner would encounter him in his unregenerate state, and he would just drop dead right on the floor. That's a fact. Scripturally, we see that. It, I don't have time to get into it now, but I want to get into the message. But that would bear it out. The, 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 the Lord breathed and the earth melted like wax. The fire came from his nostrils and consumed everything. Moses was the only one that could see the burning bush and get near it. And then God told him, Moses, he said, you cannot look and see my face and live. The glory that's in my countenance or in the gaze, the gaze from my eyes would kill any man. So God's not going to come down off his throne and help, help people get things done. It's us who have to do it. But there's a process. First the process, then the promotion. First the price paid, then the prize comes. These are two of my wisdom quotes from the Holy Ghost that I wrote in my, my great book, Prophetic Keys to Successful Living. If you don't have this yet, you can get a copy. Digitally around the world, you can get it. Just write the word book in text. So WhatsApp to plus 254. Let me give you the number. We'll put it on the screen. Plus 254. 706-164-191. Plus 254. Don't call. Don't call. Don't call. I'm in meetings. You see now I'm in the television studio live. All my phones are on silent and you can't get through to me. If you call. I, but my phones work 24 hours a day. I tell everybody that. You can write me. Don't call. You may not get me by voice call, but you can write me 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And one of the principles I'm going to share in this teaching here, one of the things I wrote down that all these people, I might as well say it now while I'm on it, all these people that want to switch off their mobile data, they go on to check and then they switch it off. There's something wrong with your head. Illustrated sermon. I was at the health shop today. It's really funny. I was laughing a minute ago. I thought, Lord, can I do it? Illustrated sermon. This is called non-GMO, which ge genetically mo modified stuff is not good. It's organic. Not, it says non-GMO. I like that. Lecithin. Lecithin. L-E-C-I-T-H-I-N. 1,200 milligrams. Nervous system support. Naturally occurring, blah, 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 very, very scientific thing here. Oh, good for brain and nerve function. I like that. So I found out this also helps with the uh, cholesterol in the blood, you know, against the LDL, that bad cholesterol. Because I just had a bunch of tests done. A couple times a year at least, at least twice a year, at least twice a year, sometimes three times. I have all the major blood tests run to know the internal state of my, all the functions of the body. So they were like, taking statins is not good, okay? Crestor, whatever, the, the anti-cholesterol medication because it has side effects. So Crestor, 20 milligrams. You just take it because you, you're lazy and you just want to combat the cholesterol, but you don't know sometimes. So the statins is also hurting you. You know, everybody kind of, a lot of people have the consensus that they're not good, though they may uh, treat the problem, okay? So I was at the health food store and I bought a whole bunch of stuff, all kinds of pills. You see my, I have a counter over here if I could show it to you with a 20 or 30 bottles of supplements. I thought one key of wisdom is to take supplements. You know, a lot of people don't even know about that. They're too poor to even think to buy stuff like that because it costs money. When you go there and it's $100, $200, ka -ching, at the till, the register, you're going to decide to invest in your health or not. So there's things you could take for your heart and your blood, uh, arter arterial health is garlic, odorless garlic, because garlic is nasty. It's nasty. It, it repeats. 
you taste nasty, your breath stinks, you, God, I, garlic, I got to take garlic. I, I don't even need it. You know what I mean? I don't need garlic in my food. Why? I don't need it. You may need it. You may think I put it in the dawa. It ruins the dawa. Dawa is this lemon, ginger, and honey. Ginger is very good for the stomach, for the digestion. It's, it's just strong. It's, it's fierce. It's got a bitter, like a, not bitter, like a spicy kind of taste to it. It's very good for the health. Lemons are very good. They're cleansing. Honey evens it out very good. And there's another thing you could take for the blood is a cayenne pepper. Cayenne pepper is very good. You add a little cayenne pepper, C-A-Y-E-N-N-E. If you're really carnal, uh, there's a Porsche car, P-O-R-S-C-H-E. Someone called it a Porsche in Africa. They call it, oh, you can get a Porsche. I'm like, what's that? I'm like, are you okay? It's Porsche, dear. Porsche. Oh, Porsche. Some people like to say Porsche. Where I come from in New York, it's Porsche. Not Porsche. Not Porsche. Okay, just to be correct about that. And uh, cayenne pepper, very nice. And um, and you got to put the garlic in it. You take a sip of that, you fouled your mouth, it stinks, it tastes nasty, it has the aftertaste. I, I'm advanced. I'm in the advanced class. I don't need it. You know why? Because I got the odorless garlic gel caps. They're little round see-through things. The liquid is in there. They've, they've grown the garlic. That It doesn't have that stink to it or that taste or aftertaste or I don't know how they do it you just take you pour you take like a whole I take too many I take like about eight of them ten of them so ten, ten is too many maybe seven or eight and pop them twice a day morning and night pop, pop, pop. before I go anywhere I take all these pills wow drink down a lot of water have a cup of uh, black uh, espresso you know from the cappuccino machine. I used to put the milk in there, but I thought the dairy's not good. I don't like dairy too much. I don't need dairy. That's another thing that's not too good. Stay, get away from the mil- all this milk and sugar. Uh, sugar substitute, I take monk fruit. The Holy Ghost is taking me here. Let's go. M-O-N-K-F-R-U-I-T, monk. I call it monkey fruit affectionately, but it's monk fruit. It's a plant from Asia. It's not sugar, but they've processed it and made it and and made it into a powder, uh, like golden, like it's almost like the golden cane sugar color. That's one. There's another one that's white. And we pick the one you want. And you put it in your coffee or your tea or in your drinks, whatever. And it's one to one in equal replacement for sugar. It doesn't taste quite as good as sugar. I'll be honest. Sugar tastes nice. But sugar is deadly. Sugar is, 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 a, is a killer. Sugar is very bad for the health. You take too much sugar, you're going toward your, your, your blood sugar problem, sugar. You're destroying organs. Cancer cells love sugar. They thrive in sugar. They make the, the, the system in the body acidic instead of alkaline. To have an alkaline diet is not a joke. It's not easy. You have to eat a lot of greens. You have to cut out a lot of the starches. You have to really work on that. It's not easy. Bread, rice, pasta. I love them all. We love them all. You you eat them. But try to take steps to, uh, to curb and get away from certain things. Too much dairy. Too much oil, too much fried food. I don't know what it is with people that everything has to be fried and full of grease. I don't want it. So the Lord it will give us you know, wisdom on how to take care of the temple. So the things that you can cut out piece by piece do. Next thing, drink a lot of water. Drink a lot of water. You're supposed to drink half your body weight in water in ounces every day. So if you're 150 pounds, you're supposed to drink 75 ounces of water a day, which is like about, how many liters would that be? Two liters. 
I don't know. I have this here. This is 500 milliliters of this really great spring water. Very good. Doesn't have an aftertaste. I think it's the best in the world. I'm going to drink some right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> start to work on these things. Father, thank you for the health lesson. <laughs> this is thrown in here. Amen. You could sow a nice offering for the advice. I appreciate it. Partner with the ministry. I'm going to be sharing a lot more. I saw myself, if, if everybody else doesn't want to do it, that's okay. I'm going to do it. Having business seminars, business seminars to train business people, because the Lord said to me clearly that the spirit of entrepreneurship is coming upon people, coming into the church. Now, how are all these young, blessed people that have a zeal for business, how are they going to learn? They're going to go learn from heathens. Maybe they need to. Because people in the world are smart. If you learn business principles from someone, it doesn't matter if they're a church goer or not. If they got the information, take it and run with it. But I saw in the spirit uh, an elite society within the church, Christian communities that are going to begin to prosper financially. And uh, let me tell you, the other communities are doing it. It's really sad. I don't want to go off into that. I'll, my blood pressure is going to go up if I think about it again too much. I'm joking, but maybe not. All these other groups of ethnicities that are complete, full-blown heathens and devil worshipers. They worship ladies' statues with eight arms. You know those ones? They worship a man dressed in a sar uh, like a silk embroidered gown with an elephant's head on a man's body. You know that one? They bow down and kiss the floor on the way down when they're all stuffed into the, their place and the whatever. They're bowing down maybe, and they're out there and they're pooling their money together in communities and they're going after London, England. They've gone after the UK. Let me tell you, every mayor now, just about every single mayor in, in Great Britain, in England, in the, across every county in the whole country from top to bottom is one of them. And I have a friend in America that's going to do a big crusade to begin to speak back against the darkness and anoint uh, the foreigners. I had a word years ago for England that was uh, part of it was that I, I really had a, a, an intercession going on with me. This was many years ago when I was in traveling throughout England doing many meetings. I think I preached in over 200 churches. I'm sure it was over 200. Anywhere the door opened, I would just go. And I was happy to do it, to serve God, whether it was 2,000 people with some, 1,000 people with some others, 1,500, 500, 800, 700. And even if the church had 50 people, you know, where, wherever would, people would invite me, if you'd get me there, I would come and I would preach. And I'm sure the cumulative time that I was there, someone blessed me with a million dollar duplex and people were partners and so into me great things. One, one gentleman flew from Copenhagen, Denmark to see me there, bought me four new computers, two laptops and two towers with the big monitors. The best in the world at the time <coughs> for our ministry office, which I had the office from the, the duplex that was given to me in the West, in the West End in Kensington, over by Kensington there by Hyde Park, beautiful, beautiful area. I have such great memories from there. I wrote a lot of my books there. I wrote a lot of prophetic words to the nations. I worked. I remember one day I sat in a chair for like 18 hours one day and I hardly moved. I think I went up to use the restroom a couple of times and went right back, sat in the chair. It's like I was glued to the chair. 18 hours, I'm telling you before God, of a, of a day. I couldn't move and I was just writing under the anointing. <laughs> on this beautiful new laptop, the best, the best in the world, state of the art at that time. And the man bought me a gold watch at Har Gucci watch at Harrods, he gave us a lot of money, and he bought me the latest smartphone, and had people come with beautiful cars and pick me up and take me to the five-star restaurants. And every day it was like that. I'd eat the best food on planet Earth in the top five-star restaurants in the city of London, the West End. 
over and over. Every day we want to go eat, we go to Benihana. I can't remember all the names of them, the Benihana, the Japanese, where they do the thing. They make the food in front of you there. And I can't remember all the names of those other restaurants. I mean, the Blue Elephant was one, the best Thai food in the Thailand food in the world. Wow. I mean, they come out with this sticky rice and the curry and little pots and all kinds of vegetables. I mean, you, 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 you felt like you were you experiencing a part of heaven. Some cities where we've been and are, you, you don't have those experiences. Very unfortunately, I miss those days but in, in that way. But... Um, and uh, I, ha I had an intercession within me to pray for the British natives, the white people, you know? Because even the West Indians that lived there for a long time, they came from Jamaica, Yaman, everything in Irie, everything Irie, man, everything Irie, man, it's cool. Hallelujah. I just had some Jamaican uh, uh, bishop and his wife here. Uh, we were fellowshipping a couple of weeks ago, preaching together in some conferences. It was a, nice to talk with them. The funny thing was, I preached at his, his birthplace on the island up on the north and top of the mountain in Montego Bay. And then in America, where his church is, the street where his church is, I actually lived there at one point. He's like, him and his wife are like, Wow, what a small, what an amazing thing. You were at my birthplace and you're at the place where our church is now and you, you were in both places. How? I said, well, by the grace of God, I've, I've done a lot of things in my life. I've been a lot of places. So I had this intercession thinking, British, yeah, you know, jolly good show, old chap, you know those guys would have to get filled with the Holy Ghost and become revivalists. But you know, they didn't, but you know, they didn't do it. Till today, they didn't do it. So this apostle friend in America had a word. I love it. I, I agree now. He says, we're going to anoint all the Africans that are there, the West Indians that are there, all the foreigners that are there. And they're going to go out and tear it up. Why? Because they have a different mentality. They're not drinking in the pubs at 5 o'clock every day, talking their stuff or doing their cultural things. And they, they don't care about God. The churches of England, the old cathedrals, they're selling them and making them into temples for the Hindus and mosques for the others. That's going on. I just heard of one group. They said they took 5 million pounds cash and bought one of the cathedrals, a big one, to stop. The other ones are right on the heels, ready to buy it. I'm telling you, there is a takeover going on in England today. My friends in England, you better rise up and pray or you're going to lose your country. It's just about gone already. Like last ditch Holy Ghost repri reprieval, if it can happen, if it can be brought back. I mean, the, pe the church is going to have to rise up in power. America is being targeted right now with this buffoon, you know, what his name starts with the same letter. And, uh, you know, letting uh, the border be overrun. 12 million people, all kinds of strange people, have run into America, and they're ruining whole cities and neighborhoods all over the country in all 50 states. It's just, well, the 48 states on the mainland, because there's Puerto Rico and the Caribbean and, it uh, wouldn't be there. And Hawaii, all the way over there, so it wouldn't be there. But the 48 on the mainland, from Texas and Arizona all the way up to Oregon and uh, Washington, all the way over to the East Coast, down across, and all across, they're flooding everywhere. And uh, what the demonic agenda is, is an infiltration of America to take over. And all kinds of evil people are running, terrorists, criminals, other nationals. They're in there setting up camps to do what? Very, very nefarious things, very diabolical things. So there's, there's a run on America. Look at Ukraine and Russia. Horrible situation. Look at this thing in Israel now. Horrible. And Iran. Horrible situation. I want to prophesy and declare we don't need to go to war with, no one needs to go to war with Russia because they're tough and they're strong and they're strong-headed and they have nuclear weapons. They, 
They, they, they're not jokers, okay? Nobody wants to take them head on. Now NATO has even gone into Ukraine. Terrible situation. Why? Because that's going to pull Finland into it and Sweden into the war and all these other people. And the president of Ukraine, he's already running out of time for his term. And he, he supposedly he just bought a 20 million pound house in London. So the money laundering thing is going on there. Arms are being sent from America going through there. It's all about money. The war machine is all about money. And it, these wicked Luciferian people, wicked people, evil people are doing horrific things. This is going on in, in, in our world. And let me tell you, in the African countries, I got first-hand information from a great man who, who was just down there, with, and he was meeting with some of the prime ministers and presidents and others in, in government and top leaders of several different nations on a tour that he just did. And he was saying that arm, big crates and shipments and containers, containers of arms, new weapons are finding their way to these African countries. How? Because the money was going. So Ukraine is the biggest money laundering scheme in the world. And then you have uh, uh, their, their farming and their land is so fertile. They're the breadbasket of Europe. Now the place is being destroyed. People killed everywhere. People dead everywhere. And there's so many Christians there. There's a lot of Christians in Russia too. And there's a lot of Christians now in Iran also. Did you know that? Yeah, the government people at the top, and I think the president just got wiped off the earth. I just think that happened last week. <laughs> anyway, whatever. Uh, yeah, and uh, 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 you have these people, these evil people doing these things, making these threats and doing these things. But on the ground, there's a movement of revival in Iran. There's also a movement of revival in China. But look at the government situation. You see... So there's such horrific things going on in our world. We need to, people need to pray. People need to really pray. So I saw this. I saw firebrand evangelists rising up. I saw prophets rising up. I saw pastors rising up. I saw teachers rising up. I saw all kinds of administrators and workers and tech people and all kinds of people, beautiful people, running things in ministry, the operations of ministry. Whoa, whoa, whoa. How's that all going to happen? It's going to, it's going to take money. So there's a realm of business coming to people. So people need to be trained in the realm of business. How it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, I, I, through what, when, who, where, and how, we're, 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 we're seeing that unfold, and we're praying for the best of the best on all of that. This thing about the health laws, taking care of your health. I mean, if you don't live long and you're not healthy and strong, then hey, what, what do you have? I love the stories about the lady in the village, like my apostle friend who I preached for Thursday. He showed me a picture of his auntie. <laughs> Guess what? She looked cute. She looked old, but she looked cute in the face, you know? Like... It was kind of eerie. It was kind of like, ooh, look at her. I was looking at, I was staring at the picture, you know? And she lived in the village, or she just died last week. She was, a, he, he says she was 114 years old. I thought, I don't know what revelation she had. I don't know what she was eating or not eating. I don't know. I doubt she was taking all these supplement pills like I was, like I'm taking. But these things are, you know, proven to work. So anyway, this is an anti-cholesterol thing, but the, the person in the health food store told me, you know, it's great for brain health and brain function. I thought, oh, I know a lot of people that need that. I'll take it myself. But I thought, then I made a joke. I said, you know, I don't know. I said, some people could take the whole bottle at one time. I don't know if they'll get help. <laughs> I'd be laughing all day about that. So, how many can you take to get this to work right? I think there's a greater miracle needed than just this lecithin supplement. Anyway, praise the Lord. Anyway, we're living in a crazy world. We have to move quickly. We have to move very quickly. 
So that's my introduction. I, um, if I have to do this and finish this in another session, so be it. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a, and I think I'll just read these very quickly, and stay on script so we can get through this quickly. Is that all right? Let's go. The title of this that God gave me today, and I must, I must get into it because. I must get into it because the Lord spoke to me in honor of him, not, not for any other reason. Except I have his agenda, and of course it's going to bless many people. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this great word. Think through my mind, speak through my lips. Let me say it right. Let me say it the way you said it to me. I've written it all down. If I, it's so voluminous and lengthy and detailed if I hadn't written it down just to remember it all as you were speaking to me over the course of the whole day from the morning till the afternoon or almost the evening. I, I don't know how I would do it. But the title of this, and to you be all the praise for what you're going to do to help people understand where you want to take them now. Here's the title. 55 new realities that come with spiritual maturity. 55, I wrote 55, it may even be 57, 58, 59 by now, but I think it's about 55. Last count, it might be a couple more. But uh, 55 new realities that come into your life when you get raised up and developed into a realm of spiritual maturity. This is extremely powerful. I'm going to read them as I got them. Number one, I'm going to go as quick as I can. Number one, wisdom. Wisdom. Proverbs 4, 7 says what? Wisdom is the principal thing, and therefore get wisdom, but when you get it, get understanding. What is wisdom? Wisdom is knowing the difference between a good thing and a bad thing and knowing how to act accordingly. Wisdom is the correct application of knowledge. I'm going to stop for one second and go back to where I was just to finish a point. Let's pray. Everybody lift your hands all around the world, wherever you are right now. Let's pray together. Father, we declare, I want to seal this thing. I want to, I want to, I'm going to deal with it more in upcoming shows, but I want, to, I want to pray right now. I want to pray and speak this. Father, what's going on in our world, please raise up the church now to begin to combat the darkness. Raise up the warriors. Raise up the revivalists. Anoint your people because without the anointing it can't happen. People think they can just do anything by idea, by thought. <clears throat> no, you have to work by anointing and instructions. Not ideas and thoughts or, you know, formulas that you, somebody formulated or you thought of. No, no, no. It has to come by instructions from the Lord and, and, and you walk under his anointing and power. Father, I pray that you anoint your people with fire. fire you will anoint your, your own people, sons and daughters, with fire and raise them up to begin to hear your voice on what you want each one of them to do accordingly and specifically to your plan of action and cause the devils in this world to be, to be subjected, to be put down, to be crushed, to be annihilated, the principalities and powers, the rulers of darkness in this world, the wicked spirits in high places, the things that are operating in and through societies and even, the, even carnal men, I'm going to talk about that in this message, the, the things that people are doing that we just see, we could just see it so clearly that those things are going to be stopped. And Father, you're going to raise up evangelists. You're going to raise up people that carry your torch and carry your fire and carry your glory to many people. And the societies are going to get more anointed and filled with your presence. You said in Habakkuk 2.14, said the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. This must happen. Dr. Paul Anetje said that last week in the crusade. He quoted that scripture again. I know he loves that verse. The glory of the Lord must fill the earth. We thank you, Lord, you said in Joel chapter 2 that you pour out your spirit and, and, and cause either the rain of fire of the Holy Ghost to come on all flesh and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will have visions and your old men will have dreams. And in those days, I will pour out my spirit on everybody and they'll begin to run. They'll begin to become armies. They'll be like swift steeds, like swift horses that run 
with fire and they'll be in order and in structure. Father, you're a God of order. I thank you, Lord, that you're going to raise people to be disciplined and walking in etiquette and proper ethics and proper motives and purity and holiness. And, and under your anointing, this is going to cause the fire of God to begin to move because you, you operate in a container thing, like a vessel. You, you fill a vessel, but you only fill a vessel who's walking according to your plan. You can't fill a vessel who's not. And too many people are just all messed up. They say they're Christians, but their life is not exemplary of anything that's, you know, they're not, they're not consecrated and dedicated unto you. And I pray that you're going to cause multitudes of people, even multiplied millions if it's possible. Let it happen in mass multitudes of people across the world. You said your eyes go to and fro over all people to begin to cause your power and your glory to, to shine upon and anoint those whose, whose hearts is perfect toward you. I thank you, Lord, you'll skip over a million people to find one who's ready for you. Make us ready. Make people ready. And this message I'm about to say, uh, get into a little bit here, if I can't get all the way through it, but uh, we'll, 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 we'll have a part two if I need to. But the Lord, the Lord, the Lord says, I, I, I'm going to anoint people. I'm looking for people who are ready. And if you're not pure and you're not dedicated and you're not zealous and you're not seeking me and you're not repentant and you're not walking according to my plan, how am I going to anoint you? But God says, I'm looking. Believe me, I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm searching the hearts of men and women to find those whose hearts are perfect toward me and I will touch them. And they'll be elevated. And not, not just for the sake of them being seen, but for the purpose of them carrying my power and glory into this generation. And the Lord says, get ready now, for this is a new day of revival. Revival has come. Revival is here. Revival is flowing. And I want to even raise reformers and revolutionaries as well as revivalists because things need to shift and change in the nations of the world. Father, bring unity because in Psalm 133 you said you'll cause, you, uh, you'll command the blessings where there's unity. And I thank you, Lord, as these other communi communities that are heathens, they don't even know God. They're not walking with God. They're totally off into some other deceptions and it's demonic. And yet they come together and they, you see they're building buildings everywhere. They're doing projects. They're building businesses. They're taking over whole places. They have the agenda and the plan to take over whole nations. Even the nation of Kenya is under siege now. And people are sitting back in the church, fighting each other, being individualistic, being unreliable, unintegritous, and they're like a bag with holes, like Haggai once said. They can't even hold the, 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 the treasure in the pocket. It falls out. He said, you're like a bag with holes. Why? Because he said, consider your ways. Consider your ways. Are people really doing that? One of the attributes of walking in maturity is being repentant and loving the will of God and adjusting yourself, taking responsibility for yourself and moving into the purpose that God has ordained. Father, I thank you that you're going to cause this to happen and you're going to raise great, great anointed men and women now in this day in Jesus' name. You're going to prosper people. They're going to prosper for the cause of advancing the kingdom around the world we're going to raise them up. We're going to see entrepreneurs raised up, people that are blessed. I said it again today. I said it out loud as I was praying, just as an emotional overflow, a thought from my mind and spirit. I said, God, I want to see people. I said it yesterday, too. I said it the day before. I say it like every day. I want to see people prosper. I want everybody to be rich. Lift your hands. Everybody should be rich and not poor. Everybody should be rich. If you're poor, there's something wrong with you yet. Something wrong with your life. You haven't entreated the favor of God. As I said last week, you have to be a tither. You have to be about the will of God, and you have to be a tither. If you haven't tithed your 10%, you haven't given anything. I gave, well, I gave this little thing. No, you didn't. You, you still owe the Lord the rest. <laughs> you owe the Lord the rest. Fix that first, and then you're, then you're a giver. As a man of God, years ago, he spoke very boldly and he put the guy off and he never saw the guy since. Very rich man. The guy says, well, I made $500 million last year. So this man of God was trying to get back to uh, his, uh, his home state, his home city. 
and his plane had a problem and he was stuck and he had a schedule. He had to be preaching the next morning in his church and this rich guy saw him, knew he was a famous uh, apostle, so he said, ah, I'm flying to this a, a neighboring city. Would you, well, you could ride with me. He said, oh, thank you. That's so nice of you. Jumped on. He said, well, I'll, uh, I'll call my wife and she could drive down to this place. It's a couple of hours drive, but she could be waiting there at the airport down there. And we'll drive back up to the house. That's, that's good. That's as close as we can get. That's where you're going. So he's on the plane with the man, and the man's telling me, you know, I gave $5 million to the gospel last year. And he was like really excited, like saying it with zeal. But he, said, he just said he made $500 million. So the man of God said something very sharp. He said, well, you're $45 million short. <laughs> You're just 45 million short to pay your, to be, make sure you've tithed. And the man sat back, put these, uh, you know, the blinders they call them when you want to sleep, stopped eating, had the stewardess, the private, on his private jet take everything away. And he sat, reclined his seat and went to sleep and never talked to the man of God again. Until today, years later, never seen him since. Like he was offended by this statement. But it's true. I gave five million dollars to the gospel, but you have 500 million. Give the 50. Then add five to it. 55 is a good number because that's how many points I have here. Good story, right? Then you think, well, can I afford to tithe? You can't afford not to. If you feel like you're going to suffer a little bit because you're going to miss that extra money from your tithe, you won't miss it because God said, in Ma let me say it while I'm on it, Malachi 3, 10 to 12, bring all the tithes in the storehouse that there'll be meat in my house and prove me now, herewith saith the Lord of hosts, and see if I won't open up the windows of heaven for you and pour you out a blessing that there's not room enough to receive it, pour you out, pour blessings out to you, but also pour you out as a blessing to others. I like the, the wording there. I think it means both. And I'll rebuke the devourer or the devil for your sake and make you a delightsome land for me, saith the Lord of hosts. That promise came to the one, but he went back, go back to the eighth verse, Malachi 3, 8 and 9. He said, you've robbed me, even this whole nation. And the people said, where have we robbed you? He said, in tithes and offerings. He said, thereby, therefore, you're cursed with a curse. In other words, a curse comes on the financial life of a non-tither. Let me tell you something. You could do the track record, look at it, see how many things broke, how much you lost, how much you suffered, how many tr troubles you got into just because you weren't tithing. Because the devil is a legalist. He was allowed to mess with you and play with you. You lost things because you didn't. If you had only been tithing all the time, and y y you would have been blessed I hear and protected. I hear stories of men that kept covenants. Number one, Maybe they married the wife, a man of God would marry a wife, and he's faithful with her and he's with her. That's one covenant, okay? The other covenant is they never lacked or failed, they never failed to tithe. One man of God told a story, I told it last week, I'll just say it real quick. He said uh, in the shower, the, power, the electricity went off while he was in the shower, and he screamed out, wow, what happened to the electricity? And the wife yelled back, where's the money to pay the bill? It wasn't there. He said, and he laughed. He started to laugh and said, I don't care. He said, he, said, he said this statement. He said he would rather die than not pay his tithes. If he had to go without lights or, had, had, or to have paid his tithe before, what would he choose? Always that. And this man today is blessed. But it didn't come overnight. I mean, he went time, year after year after year after year, being faithful, working according to the biblical principles. And that's part of this the notes I have in these 55 points. Being faithful to biblical reality, biblical doctrine, and you're working your life in obedience to scriptural teachings, scriptural principles, and scriptural laws. And then God will honor you. 
So the question appears here, what do you want? What do you want in life? I'm reading here also Isaiah 60. Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord's risen upon you. Light comes upon who? A good person. I don't think it's just cheap. I don't think it's just for everybody. Kings will come to the brightness of your rising and the forces of the Gentiles will come to you and you'll build a place that will be open day and night. It'll never be shut. And the glo- He said, I'll make the place of my feet glorious. I'll put my feet there, the Lord said. I, are you kidding me? Is that for everybody? Does everybody do that? No! Look around all your village, town, town, city, wherever you live, and look at all the multitudes of many people and say, how many of them have done it in Isaiah 60? I think some places you'll not even find one. I think many places you'll not even find one. So don't think this is just like, hey, praise God, let's sing a song. Arise, shine. For your light is come. Who, 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 who? I want to stop song. Hold it, musician. Hold it. Stop singing. Let me take the mic. Who? Y'all lift your hands. First of all, repent. Second of all, get on your knees and say, Lord, please, whatever's wrong in my life, fix it. Please prepare me and make me ready for this kind of level of glory. Right here. Right here. Foolish religious cultural, quasi, moving on, you know, everything is for us. Even Philippians 4.19 is not for everybody. He said, my God, Paul prayed, not, he didn't say your God, it's going to happen anyway. And he said, this is the promise apostolically, prophetically, I'm declaring over those that communicated with me, who were you Philippians, and nobody else blessed my ministry or helped me in supporting me like you did. Therefore, My God, I declare over you, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Is that promise for everybody scripturally in context and reality? No. It's for those that gave. And he commended the Philippians, said you gave more than anybody. Yes or yes? I think, you know, we need to grow up. This maturing thing is a heavy thing. It's a weighty thing. Lord have mercy. I'm, I'm, I'm anointed here. I'm flowing. Let, let, me, let me share a few points about what happens to you. I started out calling this title, What Happens to Someone That Becomes Spiritually Mature? Many things begin to happen. And I begin to see and I looked at my own self. And I, and I feel certain things. I think certain ways. I am a certain way because of this level. Number one, I want to say a qualification of it. It doesn't just come upon somebody just like that. You can't just ask for it and say, well, uh, I want to be a great spiritually mature person. And I want to be a great leader. And I, No, it's a process. And it takes years and years and years. Someone said... Uh, it takes like at least 15 years to become in any way spiritually mature. One man, a God friend in America said that. He said, there's no overnight sensations. You want to be a sensation, it'll take you about at least 12, 13, maybe 15 years walking with God. I believe that because I've, I've done it. More than that. And the day comes when God begins to really pre- process you so much that you change. So I want to speak about for a few moments here, new realities that come to you, things that happen, things that change, things that metamorphosize and grow in you, a way that you become when spiritual maturity has had its way in your life and it's it's developed you to a point of a a high place, you know, in, in, in the ways of God. So I started out talking about wisdom. I covered that. Wisdom is also, that's number one, the correct application of knowledge. Isaiah 11.2, powerful scripture. You receive wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, might, the fear of the Lord. 
might is strength, as we see in Revelation 5.12. Another one, a reference, uh, similarity to that. The seven spirits of God, the seven flows of the seven words, which were, Jesus said he took back, not for himself, because he's already God, and he's now in heaven. So what, what is he, how does he need to be empowered? He's already God, and he has everything. He did it for us, to give it to us. He took the keys of death, hell, and the grave for himself? No, he took them for us. It's obvious. He paid the price to be crucified, died, thrown in the tomb, and resurrected in the third day to walk out, to be a mediator, to bring his own blood to the mercy seat, and then to descend into hell, to strip the devil of the keys of death, hell, and the grave for what? For himself? What did he need it for? He's one person. He's one entity, but he's God, but he's just, he's Jesus. Was it all for him? No. He did it all for us. Did he have to do that? No. The Bible said he could have called 12 legions of angels down from heaven and said enough. They would have pulled him off the cross. They would have knocked out all of the soldiers around. Nobody would have been able to stop it. Believe me, picture the scenario if you could see it like a movie in your mind. Envision it. They would have pulled the crown of thorns off his head. They would have plucked his hands and feet off the nails. And the wounds would go, the angels would supernaturally heal him, strengthen him, put a clothes on him, clean him up, and he'd walk on. And he could have done that, but he didn't. He gave himself obediently to death, even the death of the cross, on the cross. Lord Jesus, we worship you. Thank you. Had you not done that, where would we ever end up? How could anybody be saved? Where would we be? Where would we go? Where would we end up? What an amazing thing he did for us. What an amazing thing. Thank you, Lord. A million thanks. You know, the, the, like the psalmist said, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, I couldn't. Then there's a song they made out of it. If I had a thousand tongues of 10,000 songs to sing. I, I couldn't do it justice to give you praise for who you are and how great you are and what you've done for us. Let's lift our hands and worship him for a minute. Father, thank you. In a service, there would be, this would be the time to go to a worship song and take a minute and just worship him. But I'm doing it right now. Manually, you know, <laughs> without the help of all the other accoutrements of instruments and singers and all that. Give the Lord some praise right now. Just lift your hands and say thank you. If, think about what he did for us. Just think about it. Just think about it. Think about it. Shakalasa te shakoteta shela basana machere. My God. Where would we be? Where would we end up? How could anybody be saved without the Savior? He could have stopped it all, but he didn't. So now Revelation 5.12, as I was saying, it says, he, he, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, took it back. You start, look at Revelation 5 from maybe the ninth verse. He's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world for the foundation of the world. And he, verse 12, he took back this power, riches, wisdom, strength, which is might, in Isaiah 11 too, And glory, honor, and blessing. Glory, not just for himself, but to put it upon as crowns upon us, to walk as his royalty in the earth. And honor, which we need to really succeed. You know, honor is a powerful thing. And without it, dishonor, it disconnects everything. It, it disrupts, it corrupts, it corrodes, it disconnects, it short circuits the flow of goodness. Honor and blessing. Blessing is the, 
the touch of God to empower you. Blessing is making you to increase and to prosper. Curse, a curse is to make you diminish and lose and fail. You're empowered to prosper by being blessed. You're empowered to fail by being cursed. Some people are cursed because they brought it on themselves. Proverbs said the curse causeless doesn't come. Can you see this uh, blessing and anointing factory flowing through me? It's like a it's like an industry of its own inside of me, and I'm just speaking by utterance in the Holy Ghost as this prophet, as I do all the time. You know, this is great when I sit here and I'm in the studio here, we can just speak like this freely. There's no noise, there's no other people, there's no time constraint, there's no expectation of people where you gotta do things in a certain way of time, or you, you flow in a different way. We could just share deep revelation and teaching here. And I do the other things also, but I love this as well because we get to just flow in. I'm still on number one. Can you believe it? Wisdom. All right, one more. Luke 2.52. Thank you, Lord. Isaiah 11.2. Throw that across the screen again one more time. Uh, Isaiah 11.2. If you could do it now, great. If not, we'll do it in post-production. Then, Revelation 5.12. Wow, I love it. Power and riches. Power and riches to enforce the power and then wisdom to know what to do with the riches and the power. If you don't have wisdom, man, I think humility should be added in there. If you want to add another one, humility. Because if you're all proud and arrogant, hey, yeah, yeah, you're, you're, not, you're, not, you're, not in, you're not in good shape with God to have longevity, you know. Humility, let me tell you something, humility brings longevity. Humility ensures that you really got a handle on who God is, how he is. I love you, Lord, so much. This is wonderful. And then the other scripture is Luke 2.52. Luke 2.52 talked about Jesus growing over time, coming into maturity, and then walking in favor, wisdom, watch, wisdom and stature, a high stature. Maturity will give you stature and power. And wisdom will give you great ability to lead in life and become a great leader. And... Wisdom and stature, and then he grew in favor with God and man. So favor is a a splendiferous manifestation of the Holy Ghost. When favor comes to you, God's favor to you, for you, and through you. And for you. To you, through you, and for you. For you is is a third realm, a higher realm, when... It's like happening for you without you even knowing about it or you may know about it, but you didn't like work it up and cause it to happen. God causes things to favor you. That's a very supernatural thing. And I command it to be so in the realm of the spirit tonight, tomorrow in manifestation, every day as we go on. Favor, God doing things for us. Yes, he speaks to us. He does things to us and then through us to others, but then when he does things for us by his favor, we could, it's like we couldn't have done it just by ourselves. And I command that to be going into motion right now, this night. I'm saying this for a reason, because this thing's about to happen tomorrow, and the favor of God has to be there. Father, touch everyone involved. You know what I'm talking about it. I've prayed at length about that. And it's going to happen tomorrow in Jesus' name. Wisdom, number one. Number two, responsibility. I also added that toward the end. Responsibility for what? Taking responsibility for your life. Being responsible in your character and actions, but also knowing that you have to fix things yourself. 
With the help of God, yes, but you have to work on them yourself. Number three, another thing that comes, there's 55 or 56 or 7 of them, so if I don't get through them all in this, I'll, I'll do it part two, but let's see. Discernment, great discernment. You know, I started to feel, especially last night, where, where was I yesterday? Was it yesterday? Or was it Friday? No, it was Friday. I was in this place and I was looking at different people in this mall and I was just seeing the uncleanness of people. The state of their life, it's like I could see right into who they are, how they are, and I was feeling disturbed by it. That level of discernment is the disturbing thing. Also, going back to number one, when you get wisdom, it's also a laborious thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, there's a price to pay for having wisdom because you see all the foolishness in the world and it, it affects you because you can see it. But, no, but when you have great discernment, you, you just can see into every situation and you're like, oh my God, I'm seeing this. You also begin to walk in a realm of holiness and your, your life is consecrated unto God. So when you see something that isn't, it's disturbing to you. It's repulsive to you. It's disgusting to you. It even could be look, look hor horrific to you. I've been feeling that a lot. I know it, it comes like as it, it's part of a prophetic, you know, insight in a, gift, in, a, in a way of gifting, but it's also a realm of maturity because you know what God has done in you and it's, you're, it's manifested. And when you see uh, things on the outside that are not good, you can really see them for what they are. So I, I want to prophesy to everybody, get ready for more wisdom for the Spirit of the Lord to help you take responsibility for everything, for more discernment. These are attributes of new realities and things that happen for you when you begin to walk in spiritual maturity. And God does want to raise us up. Remember he said in Ephesians 4.11, I gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, that we all become uh, walking in realms of perfection. We become like a perfect man, grown up into the stature of Christ. I love Galatians 4.1. Galatians 4.1 is very profound. It says, you'll differ nothing then from being a child if you don't discern who you are. Even though you're Lord of all, you'll differ nothing then from a servant or a child. Though you be Lord of all, Paul said. You are Lord of all, but because you don't walk in it, you don't understand it. Like Haggai 1 says, consider your ways. <laughs> you have a bag with holes in it and the pockets with holes in them. Can't keep anything. Like leak, and even when the Holy Spirit touches you, it leaks out. You have to watch also your, your associations with unclean people. Be very careful. The Bible said, touch not the unclean thing and have no company with it. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers and filthy heathens. The filthiness that they walk in. Yes, go to preach to them and bring them into Christ. Don't be afraid to interact with them because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. This is a great teaching here. My God, share this with everybody. Please share this. Let other people. You know, when you sow a seed, uh, that will be, a seed is anything that will benefit the life of another when you sow it. You're sharing this by copying the URL, clicking the link or the page, and sharing it out with friends, putting it on your status on WhatsApp, sharing. You could share this on your own page. You could take the YouTube link as the link, copy the URL, copy the link, Send it to everybody through your WhatsApp, uh, to everybody around the world. You could just put it in there and keep click, 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 five at a time, whatever it is. Or if you have a, a group or broadcast, put it in the groups. Amen. And uh, Facebook, you could share it on your page. You could also copy the link and send it out to other people. That's a seed you sow that God will grow because you're helping benefit someone else's life. 
Let me tell you what a definition of a seed is. The definition of a seed is anything you possess, whatever it is, that when you sow it, it benefits the life of another. And you, as you plant it, it's beneficial to other people. Somebody else or someone else or some others, plural. And then God sees that and he goes, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a harvest to this one because they're being good to other people. Sow seed every day. I heard a great uh, wise thinker uh, from Nigeria I have to look up his page and go back and see this training that he did. He's doing a lot of success trainings. He's a very brilliant man, a very eloquent speaker. He's around in the vicinity where I am, but he he does these live online shows, and I just happened to see him. Uh, He popped up in the feeds, and he said this. He said, everybody has leverage. You you may not have everything you want, but you have some leverage. He said, even a broken clock is right twice a day. Even a broken clock can be right a couple of times a day. He said, you have some leverage of some kind. There's something you have. God left nobody with nothing. You have influence. You have a gift. You have friends. You have some resource. If you don't have a lot of resource, you, you have leverage in different, in different arenas. Are you saying that? There's something you can do that will catapult you. It'll be a springboard for you to go to the next place. And God has given that to everybody. Leverage. I like the principle. I want to go listen to the rest of that message that he's doing on that. Discernment. Okay. Number four. You get to this realm of like no nonsense. I can't tolerate nonsense. I can't tolerate things on a low level. It doesn't mean that I can't be smooth and at peace and overlook and be patient. Because another principle to balance it out, you become more merciful. Because, you know, the scripture says a merciful man doeth good to his own soul. You understand that. Then you become a little bit more patient. Why? Because you have understanding. I love Proverbs 4. Get wisdom and with it get understanding. And Isaiah 11.2 talked about the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of wisdom, and counsel, and might, and the fear of the Lord, and the spirit of understanding. Understanding means what? You understand. You, 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 You understand the reality of what you're looking at, what you're dealing with. You also know, another principle here, Some people say, how could somebody do something so evil or so untoward or so stupid? How could they be like that? What's wrong with them? You know, they get all emotional. I'm saying, you're saying that from a heart that, and a mind that you understand the situation, but they don't. So I, I, the Lord had me come up with this statement. You can't rationalize the irrational. Something's irrational, very irrational, and you want to rationalize it. Because you see it for what it is, but you can't change that. That's why Proverbs says, uh, when in the presence of a fool, (laughs) don't try to uh, change them because they'll hate you. Don't cast your pearls among swine, Paul said also. Who said that? Did Jesus say that? Was that from Jesus or Paul? Don't cast your pearls amongst the swine. I think Jesus even, I think it was even Jesus. And uh, when in the presence of, of a fool, depart. Don't try to impart all the time. Because, because Solomon said in Proverbs, answer not a fool lest you become like him. Don't answer a fool according to his folly. But there's another little verse there that says, sometimes you have to confront a fool just to make your position known that this is a no-nonsense zone. Whether they like you or hate you or not, sometimes you have to correct and confront somebody and just lay it out. But most times you don't. Here's another another wisdom key, another wisdom formula here in life. When you see a liar, don't tell them you're a liar. Don't say, hey, you're a liar. When you see a thief, don't let them know that you know they stole. 
Because they're not going to change. They're just going to devise something else evil against you. They're full of the devil. They're full of wickedness. They're criminals. Put them out of your world with a smile. It's the best way. When something's not right, you don't have to tell them, hey, you idiot, you filthy infidel. God's going to judge you. You know, you're, you're, you're stupid. You, well, what are you doing? How can you be like that? Who do you think you are? You think we don't know? Blah, 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 blah. No, that's foolish. It's folly. Don't do it. Just smile and say, yeah, okay. I'm busy, you know. I'll talk to you later. Enjoy your day. Sometimes it's good that somebody that's evil can find out or, or stumble upon the, the knowledge that they did something wrong and other people know about it, it'll make them run away because they're guilty. That can be good. God can arrange that. But you don't always have to do it yourself. Dr. Mike Murdoch, who's a dear friend, great man of wisdom, he said this. He says now he's 78 years old. I think when he was 77 75 even, he was making these things in. I'm 75 years old, son, and I've never seen a liar or a thief repent or change in my life. <laughs> he said he never has. And, he, and he's the one that started to talk about this, and I, I got some insights from him on this as a dear mentor and friend and apostle, a great, great wise man, a great sage, a brilliant uh, man of wisdom. He said, don't confront the thief or a liar. Don't tell him you know. Just, a, you know, maneuver. Because a snake is a snake. And he says, I, I've seen them along the way. It's very, very horrible. It's very painful. It's very destructive, you know, the experiences and the losses. You, by trusting, even trusting somebody that you thought was good and they're no good. He said, but they, they won't change it's pretty sad, you know. Hell was made for the devil and his angels, but I wonder if some people were just destined, you know, for that because they can't change. One thing about maturity, you'll, you'll start to figure out how to repent. You want to repent about everything. What's wrong in my life? How can I fix it? Lord, please forgive me. Please don't hold this to my charge. Help me to sort this out. Whatever it is, everybody has some issue somewhere. But just be real. Can I, can I teach as a real prophet, as a real teacher, as a real mentor, as a real pastor? You have a problem. You. I have a problem or two. Everybody has a problem in a different arena. It doesn't mean you're a willful willful. willful willful, it's hard to say, sinner, I'm not. I'm a righteous man. I'm a holy man of God. I'm walking with Jesus. I'm living for him every day. But there's always something in the human life that needs to be corrected and directed into a, a greater realm of being fixed somehow. You understand that? When you begin to get more mature, you also get this don't care mentality. Like, I know I'm right. I don't have to prove anything. I don't have to compete with anyone. I don't have to impress. Uh, great statement. Dr. Paul Inetje said, we're not called to impress. We're called to be the, to, we're called to express. We're not called to make an impression. We're called to be the expression of God in the earth. And I noticed this thing about men that are mature, that really are walking in fire and power. They've been doing it a long time. They're very confident. They're very relaxed. And they're very secure. Their yay is yay. Their nay is nay. They know what they're doing. They know where they're going. And their words have power God, because God has anointed them. And they're just like that. There's no pretense about them. They're not trying to impress anybody. They never say anything to like manipulate anybody or try to impress anyone. They never. They never do it. They just never do it. Pure agendas, going out of sequence here, but um, by the Holy Ghost, but I'll get back to my notes. They never uh, 
do anything by agenda. I, I want to tell this certain apostle, I want to remind him. I know he knows anyway, because we're going to have a conversation soon. My agenda when I prophesy, I think it's the purest thing in the world. I'm the purest voice. I'm not saying that to give accolades to myself or put myself up or brag on myself. I'm not doing it for that. I'm not saying I'm not saying it for that. I'm not doing I'm not doing that. I'm just saying my agenda when I tell somebody, don't say it the Lord or anything, God, because God talks to me every single day. When I shared, he spoke to me all day today. Can you imagine I wrote 55, 56, 57 points down in, in my notes here, uh, dictated some and typed the others. Even I was in the shower and I had a jump, I, when I thought I was going to forget, and I actually got out and went to grab the phone in the other room and say one, and then I forgot the second one I had. <laughs> so while I was finishing in the shower, I had to, I had to say, I had to, I had to get the first, the first word of each point so I wouldn't forget, and I was going over it. See, right now, I got I to gotta, I gotta refer to my notes. Oh, which one? Do I? Oh. Okay, I, these words, protocol, like, responsibility, and pure. And I kept saying it over and over so I wouldn't forget the first, the first one. Protocol, like, responsibility, and purity, pure. So protocol means you have a structure and order of things. You know, small children and young people and people that are just running all over the place, they don't know what protocol is, structure, order, things of an organization. They don't know what it is. And, and, and to know what you like and what you don't like, you're just realistic on that. I know what I like and I know what I don't like. There was a famous line from the movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Eraser it was called, 1996. Boy, that was a great movie. And I don't endorse, I can't really endorse movies, but by, I watched it and I thought it was it's really a great movie. It's it's, it doesn't have any real unclean things. A lot of, a little bit of violence and a real thick drama plot, you know. It's a bit, it's a bit wild. But there, there was this one guy, this Russian guy, and he said to the lady in the movie, he goes, I think what I like and I do what I like. You will soon learn about these. And sometimes for movies, I like to get good lines. I like to get the line and try to remember the line. I think what I like and I do what I like. You will soon learn about these. And he was an evil criminal. He was the arch, he was the arch villain. He wasn't a good guy. But what a statement. Are you there yet in your life? You know what you like, you know what you don't like, and you'll have it. Maturity. Hey, people writing me messages. I've been watching some of your meetings. Thank you very much. Okay, so responsibility is another one. This is like number 53, 54. Wow. Take responsibility for your own life, I wrote. And God, take responsibility for your own life. I wrote this. And God will bless you. Don't blame other people all the time, but take responsibility for yourself and for everything. That can be fixed. You'll work on that and get it done. You're taking responsibility and you'll work on it and things will be fixed with the help of the hand of God. You say, God, I lift this up before you. Sorry that it happened. Again, whatever it is, because everyone has some formula of application. You know, people can stand in church and lift their hands and sing. They go home. They have another issue to deal with. They leave. They have something else on their mind. Come on! This is real. For everybody in some way or another. Next point, which is the last one I wrote here. Purity in your motives. You know if you're pure in your agenda or not. 
the production of life, the acceleration in things in life, the blessings of the Lord in things in life, will automatically happen for you by the hand of God and his favor coming upon you to bring you even his promotion. I got to I got to reword it a little bit. For, this could become a great book, couldn't it? You feel the need to know also to prosper. You feel the need to know how to prosper and actually do that because you need provisions for the vision. Another thing spiritual maturity or maturity in age also time of in life is ticked along. You 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 value time. You understand the concept of the time. You also begin to think about what's coming next. What do I have to get done? How much time do I have? What are my possibilities? You, you may never have thought about that all your life, but I'll tell you that day will come. I tell you this by the Holy Ghost because I know myself. The day will come when you begin to think about all these things. What's unfulfilled in your life? It needs to be fulfilled now. What is the plan of God for you? You need to know exactly what it is and do it now. It's a precious little girl, daughter of an apostle. I was at her, her birthday party yesterday. Uh, and a whole bunch of kids. I took some videos and photos there that I can share with everybody. So I like to document the experience. Everyone can see. I got blessed. Everybody can get blessed as I got blessed. Why? Because I can tell you the story. And I can show you the video. And I can show you the photos. And tell you the story of what happened there. But this precious little girl... She's just five years old. She just turned five years old. So I said, baby, come here. I want to pray with you. And dad was there and mom was there. I grabbed her. I put my arm around her and I grabbed her on the shoulder. And I said, Father, bless this young girl. And I said, let her know her purpose in life. Let her get into it from now, not later. And begin to gear her life into what your gifting is, your specific talent and calling that you have for her and your perfect will in her life. Let her get into it. Mom and dad said, hey, yes. God had me prophesy over their teenage son. The most amazing word. I have to find that file. I have it in the archives. I promised I would go and get it. I haven't given, given it to them yet. We got so busy. But the Lord spoke this amazing word over this young man for his esteem, for his victory, for his level of royalty, his level of stature in life. It was, it was phenomenal. God! Anyway, I know where I can find the file. It's a little bit challenging. I'm going to have to go into the archives and find it, but I will find it and get it to them. Then, is another one. The daughter I was preaching 17 years ago. No? Was it 17 years ago? Yeah. Fifteen years ago. Fifteen years ago, she was a little baby like this. Tiny little beautiful baby girl, just born recently, in her mother's arms. And the Lord had me prophesy over this little girl. Do you know, I met her when I prophesied over the brother. We were at the Archbishop's house. He invited, because I spoke in the conference. He invited us there. For dinner in his house. What a palatial mansion he's built. It's just amazing. And we were there, and uh, the little girl saw me. Now she's 15 years old. She ran up to me. She was 15 years old then. She ran up to me. She was, this was last year. And she was so happy to see me, and she hugged me, and she smiled, and she kind of jumped up and down a little on her feet. And I was like, wow, look at you. She's so tall. I said, I remember when you were a little baby, and I prayed over you, that you'd be such a... I, I even said she would be a champion. Can you believe it? I said, you're going to be... There's an arena, you're going to be a champion. Do you know, she just won the swimming competition in America, she's in school in America now, she's gone to America. She's a, she's a swimming champion now. And she's looking at the best colleges to go to, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Rutgers, the big ones, and seeing which one she's gonna to go to college. Brilliant, she became a champion. 
and this was when she was a little baby, God spoke that over her. It's amazing. Purpose, destiny, direction. Father, I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice that they can know exactly what it is you've ordained because if they don't get into it, what is the, what is the real benefit of their life? We, we're not just here to exist. We're here to flourish and prosper and do the will of God. Amen. Well, I think I'm going to do a part two on this. I want to say a few other points. Another point, not in sequential order here, but you begin to understand, maturity will help you begin to understand that you must be where God wants you to be. I, I said this, I thought of this when I was getting ready and I had to jump out to go to the other room to dictate the notes and go back. I, 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 it was, the thought was so strong. I said it's, it's more beneficial to, be, to get to Nineveh like Jonah did than stay at Tarshish. Though Tarshish was naturally beautiful, Nineveh was a, probably a horrible place. And the way he got there in the belly of a fish, not good. Not pro- that's not prosperity and luxury and opulence. That's not that kind of life. He was taken another way because God had a plan and he had to get there. Tarshish is like, was the prosperous port, the business capital, where they had nice houses and business and trade and commerce, everything nice. And Jonah liked the natural part of that. But see, those places are naturally great but spiritually boring. I know what that's like. Like some place you could have a beautiful house, beautiful car, in a place like a paradise kind of place. Everything's excellent, great. But you're not doing your ultimate function. You're, then you're still in the wrong place. God has to take you to your Nineveh. You get to the point where it's like, I just have to, I, I, I just have to get there. You really want to please God as you grow up more in Him. You really want to get His assignment done. You see the folly of people. I talked about that a little bit. I'll, I'll, get, I'll, I'll, I'll complete that point in another one. You start thinking of ways to repent, things to repent about, to clear your files. I said this, the Lord showed me, a lot of people walking around with their spiritual filing system is corrupted and full of corruption because they never repented. They go to church, hallelujah, praise the Lord. They go back, and they did all these things, but they never got them cleared. Let me give you some scriptural pr- uh, ways of doing it. 1 John 1 and 9, confess your sin to the Lord, whether it be of omission, meaning something you were supposed to do that you didn't do yet, or something you did that, the commission that you did that you weren't supposed to do, and ask the Lord to forgive you, and he said he will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Have you prayed that prayer? If you haven't, over everything in your life, you still have unrepented of sin in your vessel, in your filing system, in your life, and this is not good. Repent about what? Everything. Anything you can think of. Tell the Lord I'm sorry. You know, years ago, years and years and years back, the, the Holy Spirit would never have me get into this. But the last couple of years, I guess the last two, three, four years, I've really been able to talk about this and tell the church. And I say it like in live meetings. And I lead people in the prayer, you know. Maybe some to get saved. We need to do that even more. Believe me, we need to do that more. But just people that are there that are Christians already, they're already born again. They may even speak in tongues and all that, uh, but they have problems in them. They have, un, they have unforgiven sin in them. I'm scared. You know, the fear of the Lord comes as an attribute of the Holy Ghost. Are you hearing me? It's one, of the, it's one of them in Isaiah 11 too. The fear of the Lord, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. When you begin to feel dread about some things and you think about certain things, guess what? The Lord would say, that's the fear of the Lord working in you. It's a good thing to have. If you didn't have it, 
You know, the Bible, the Bible said, too, that God will not always strive with certain men. If the Holy Spirit decides to leave you alone, you're in big trouble. You're done. You're heading to destruction. What if he doesn't convict you anymore? What if he just leaves you to your own devices and he doesn't touch you? He doesn't draw you to himself. He doesn't invite you to anything. He doesn't include you in anything. He doesn't include you by speaking to you. You know, some people say in the church, they always have this thing teaching about what do you do when God is silent? I don't know. It doesn't, it's really not happening for me. God talks to me all the time. One way you know that you're in the place of assignment is when the voice of the Lord is loudly moving in you. He's always talking to you. As his prophet, I have a special extra grace on this. You say the Lord speaks to you every day. Every single day I hear his voice. I heard some big apostles say, you know, these people that they think they hear from God all the time. You know, God doesn't speak all the time. and They say things like that, you know. But with me, I beg to differ. I don't have to beg, I just differ with that because he talks to me. What a privilege that God would speak. And today I had a, I had a very, this is part of maturity now. I think it's growing more higher up in, in stature and the things of God. Definitely it is from that. I started to think, well, what a gift that God talks to me all the time. But what, what if I don't do anything with it? I'm scared of that. I don't want to be the one that God, if God would ever have aught with me to say, I spoke to you so much, but you didn't do everything that I was telling you to do. I, let me tell you something. Right now, today, I want to speak this prophetically over people. I definitely have decided I can't get this message done in one shot because it's very lengthy and I have so much more to cover. But so there'll be a part two to this. When I, which day, I don't know, but it, it'll happen. About this realm of spiritual maturity. New realities, things that happen for you when spiritual maturity comes forth in your life. <laughs> but we don't want to be hearers only and not doers, yes? James said that. He said, you say you have faith? Hey, sure. I'll show you my faith. He was a little bit facetious there, sarcastic. He said, I'll show you my faith by what I do. It wasn't just James, it was also Paul. In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, who many have just believed it was the Apostle Paul, who else was it? Sounded like Paul to me. The flow was like Paul. It very much sounds like Paul. The way Hebrews was written, very much like Paul. I don't think there was a new person added to the roster to write the book of Hebrews on the level of how deep it is, how profound it is. It just sounds like Paul to me. Anyway, it doesn't say there the name of the author, so we'll leave it to the wind and to the Lord. But the writer of Hebrews in the 10th chapter from the 35th to the 38th verse. Let's look at that. Now, that, now don't, ca he said, cast not away your confidence for it has recompense of great reward. Confidence. Confidence in God. And the just shall live by his faith. And the just will walk by faith. That's powerful. The just shall live by his faith. Confidence comes from knowing God, not quitting, being persevering. Your faith will increase through that. And Hebrews 6.10 Hebrews 6.10 said, God is not unjust to forget our labor of love. We're continuously ministering. He's going to take care of us and bless us. Can you say amen?
Yeah, I saw this realm of, I think I'll close with this, but I saw this realm of what the Lord's been dealing with me about, this realm of, like, and many are prophesying to, many have prophesied to this, this to me lately. Many. Great voices of very seasoned men, very powerfully, very powerfully anointed men. Not novices, small people, great, great, great generals, great people. Talked about high realms of leadership and even becoming an apostolic father, a bishop ordained, uh, a leader, a father to many, an apostolic leader, an apostolic father. It comes from maturity. And I thought about that today as I heard the Lord speak that principle to me. I thought, this is not something that you could just ask for and receive. It's something that gets built in you and, and you get prepared for it over many, many years. But when it happens, it happens. And that's a, a new reality that comes from spiritual maturity. And I want to say, like, whatever it is that God's called me to do, that included. And whatever God has called you to do, let it happen. Let God develop you. I feel the anointing. I feel the anointing. I'm turning off my nose. Let's pray. I'm, I feel the anointing. You, you want to be a giver. You want to sow. You want to tithe. You want to, offer. You, you want to work the laws of economics that you can break through, that you have abundance to flourish and to move in the dimensions and plan of God. And I pray that that happens for you now. Being stuck without resources. I, I hate the devil and I hate people lacking anything. And the days are coming where we're going to be flourishing in abundance. Why? For the purpose of God. As I was teaching this last Sunday on divine formulas for financial abundance, what, one of them was, the, the theme that was kind of rolling through it a lot, what I noticed was, by the Holy Ghost, as I was speaking, was for the purpose of God, for the purpose of God, for the purpose of God, for the plan of God, for the, His plan of action, what He wants us to be doing. Prosperity is for that. A definition of prosperity, a great one that I, I love so much, is this. Having enough of God's provision and supply to do His will, to get His job done to get his mission accomplished. Having enough of God's provision and supplies, in abundance even, to get done what he wants done. When you become spiritually mature, you begin to think about that. You say, I have to have it. You have to sacrifice. Now, I know a man of God, I was listening to him today for a few minutes. I'll turn it back on when I have time later and watch the replay. Uh, on, on the big screen, but I just turned it on for like five minutes and he was saying this. He said, I remember when I bought people cars. I bought them cars. I helped them. I sowed seed over many years. Gave my car away twice. I gave, bought cars for other, uh, some of my staff, servants, all kinds of people, blessed them. And then someone came and gave me a, a Falcon, a Falcon 50 jet to use for free. It's mine to use. They maintain it. I pay the fuel. They take, all the, take care of all the expenses of, as owners. But I use it at will. And you know they're serious about the gift to this man of God. But the last they said to him, can we paint your ministry logo on the tail of the plane? You know they're not joking when they say that. They're not planning on taking it back. They're actually putting his insignia like his name, the name of the ministry, on that jet. That means it's permanently for him to use as, basically that's what they're saying, as long as you want, until you buy another one, get another one, don't need it anymore, we switch up, uh, but it's yours to use. We own it, it's one of our fleet of planes, in our fleet of planes, but it's God's gift to you to empower you to travel everywhere. Take care of the fuel, Run your schedule, the jet is at your disposal. Isn't that powerful? And, he could, and it's parked in the hangar at his airport. So he doesn't have to wait for a charter to fly in, something goes wrong. You know, it's there, it's there, it's there. So, keep working. 
Keep giving. Make giving your lifestyle. A lot of people don't give anything to anyone. They just take, 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 take. You think that's okay? That's not godly. The New Living, it's either the New Living Translation NLT or one of them that says it like this. King James is really kind of crass. It says, the liberal soul shall be made fat. Fat means big, but fat is not necessarily the greatest word. Liberal, politically, is a very bad word. So we understand what they mean, liberal meaning. But the liberal political thing now is a disgusting demonic thing. It has nothing to do with liberality as it was liberty, liberation. It's not that. But I like the new translation that says, the generous person, their life will become like a well-watered garden. Think about it. Be like that. You want to get blessed by God? Be a giver. Give out, give out, give out, give out, give out, give out, give out. I remember years ago when I was coming up in the church years ago and I used to buy everybody. I always used to pay the bill at the restaurants. I used to do it all the time. The bill would come, I'll pay it. Give me the check, give me the check, give me the check. Give me. I still do it, I still do it. I do it, I did it the other day. I do it every day, every time I'm somewhere. I don't like when I'm feeling like obligated. Sometimes if I'm with a bunch of people and I don't know them and I know they're gonna be tricky about it, I'll just come and sit there, talk to them. I order nothing, and then I dash out. They all ordered stuff. You see the table, that's everything. Oh, that's not my bill. No, you, you came. I'm just meeting you. You take care of that. You got to watch these, uh, some of these people and their cultural nonsense. They think someone else is going to pay for them. Well, no, 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 no. Uh, no. Sometimes that's not appropriate. But with good people... I used to always drive people places. God gave me cars. I used to always pay the bill for people at the restaurants. Listen to what happened. I was in London, England, and we had people that took me to the best restaurants. I made reference of it. I mentioned it before. And I'm telling you, can I tell you, the bill of restaurants went up over 100,000 British pounds. You think I'm kidding? I kind of calculated and did the math over the months and all the times we went. 100,000, more, even more, British pounds. 100,000 British pounds. How much is that? It's about 16 million Kenyan shillings, probably. Oh, yeah. No problem. You're with rich people that can do. I never paid the bill once over there. I never paid the bill. Unless I went somewhere on my own with some other men of God, we split it or I paid it again. But as long as I was in my flow and I had to, we had to go eat, there was a regiment. We'd go, let's go to the restaurant. Boom. I never saw the bill. That was a harvest on all the seeds I sowed. So is, is God unjust to forget our labor of love? No. Is he mocked? No. What a man sows, he'll reap. Ephesians 6, 8, whatever a man does good for another man, another person, the same the Lord will do back for him. Proverbs eleven twenty five 25, again, a generous person will become like a well-watered garden. That's how their life will be. A tither will experience three things. The outpouring of blessing, the rebuking of the devil that he can't mess with you, and you become like a delightsome land, the scripture says, a blessed place. Just because you gave God his 10%. Back in Genesis 26, look at he, even in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 7 talked about the tithe. Melchizedek received the tithe, and Abraham, was he rich or not? He became, he was Abram, now he became Abraham. And even Abram, because he was flown in obedience to God, he be, the Bible says in Genesis 13 too, he became very rich. Proverbs 10, 22 says what? The blessing of the Lord makes one rich and adds no sorrow. 
but the blessing, it's the blessing of the Lord. God had to decide to bless you. Amen? Hello? God had to decide to bless you. And if you're walking in the ways of his truth and reality of his life, he will bless you. All these attributes, all these functions, all these things bring us into maturity. God wants us there. Father, thank you. I've spoken by the Holy Ghost here these moments, and we thank you, Lord, that I'll make a book out of this. It's a great book. Fifty. It might be 60 points by the time I get done. Or more. I had some story. I had a lot of little keys in there. I don't have time to do it now. If I, I feel like I, something's pulling me. Like, like I almost want to uh, go back and grab it, but I'll d stay disciplined and wrap this here for time. We'll see you on the next broadcast. I'm Thomas Manton IV. There's a clip that we have that um, last Sunday I, I really did it in, 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 at length uh, explanation of the ways to give and partner. It may be up to 10 minutes long. Uh, we maybe get, can get an abbreviated version of that, but I think it's great to listen to. We can take the clip and add it to the post-production to say, now, here, watch this, and, uh, and I'll share about ways to give into the ministry. I really was in a flow of the Holy Ghost. I don't normally share all that. It was rare, and we recorded it, so I really think it's great to present to people. One thing I didn't say that I thought of if you'd like to do something by bank wire, a bank transfer, ask me for the details and I'll get you the banking. I just saw an angel flash right here, right on that right there. Can I tell you, the angels of God are going to bless givers and partners of the ministry. I just saw him right here, just standing right over here. Standing right there, the flash of light, I saw his wings. He's standing right here, right here in the studio. Father, thank you, the angels of God are going to go visit your people as they begin to operate according to your plan and purposes, as those that are giving, tithing, offering, sowing seed, connecting with this grace and this anointing, you're going to begin to, what is another one over there? There's two. Oh my God, there's three. I see like two, 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 at least two of them here. Father, I could see them. You say, you see them? Yes, like really, I see them. The eyes of the prophets see. This, this, this discerning of spirits. I've had this gift for over 30 years. Longer than that, over 35 years, more than 35 years, even, when was 1986? When was 1988 to now? 98, 08, 18, plus six. That's over 36 years even maybe 37 years I've had the gift of the discerning of spirits given to me from heaven when the Lord visited my life and he called me. So I, I've, been, I've been doing this. I've been doing this around planet Earth. 32 countries, all six continents, millions, billions of people, millions of miles uh, cumulatively. And uh, when I see them, I see them. They're here. You know, the scripture says, the scripture says, When you sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. When you connect with the biblical economic system, God will begin to bless your life. That's so real. So some people are coming into things. You want to do something sizable. Contact me for the details, and I'll show you how you can do by bank transfer. I don't know if we have the clip right now to add right to this right now, especially we're on live, so I'll just say this. You can send by M-Pesa, you can do by SendWave, you can do by PayPal. You can call me and do in person if you'd like to sow a, 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 a sizable seed. And I would love to give our partners a gift uh, from me, signed copy of this book, Prophetic Keys of Successful Living. 
Use the things that will be on the screen also. And PESA, PayPal, SendWave. Uh, if you'd like to do Western Union, the old-fashioned way of sending money from a city, contact me. I'll give you the details of how to do it. Then you can send us the code number when you've done it. And the Lord bless you, keep you, make his face to shine upon you, give you his peace, but also give you his power, his glory, and his prosperity. For it's the will of God for you to be blessed, to be rich and not poor. And I'm standing for this for you and for all of us, that we'll be, we will be very prosperous. And especially because we're about the Father's business. God bless you. Looking to hear from me. I'll be praying for you as I receive your seed, your tithe, your offering, your seed. And if you'd like to get a, a copy of the book as a partner, as a generous partner, it's my gift to you. Okay? And I will sign a copy for you. Or you can get it digitally around the world. Just remind me and we'll get it to you. The Lord bless you, keep you, cause you to prosper, and give you his power in this day greater than you've ever seen. The, the, the angel's right there, standing right here. My God, the power of God is in this place. There's a prayer I want to pray too. Satan, take your hands off people's money. Take your hands off our resources. We command you, by the blood of Jesus and the power, the authority of the word, the blood, and the name of Jesus Christ, you are rebuked in Jesus' name. And Lord, now send your angels your ministering spirits to cause the monies to come into our hands from everywhere. Resources, vehicles, equipments, people, good people, houses, lands, properties, businesses, all kinds of endowments, all kinds of resources, all kinds of treasures. We receive them right now. Cause them to come to us in Jesus' mighty name from everywhere, from every heart, from every mind, from every account, from every source. From everywhere on planet Earth, we speak to the north, south, east, and the west of the four winds of the Spirit. We speak fire even to the ends of the earth. Surprise us, Lord, with people that have been watching us from afar. They'll contact us and say, you know what? You're a blessing. You're anointed. I, I want to connect with you. We didn't know each other before, but here I am, and here's my great treasure into your life and ministry. This is going to happen. I thank you, Lord, that you're going to cause people on the ground that are with us everywhere, here, there, and everywhere, to begin to prosper in new ways. Uncanny miracles, supernatural blessings in ways, things they can't even explain it. Like Ephesians 3.20, Paul said, the Apostle Paul wrote, I, I, it'll be above and beyond what you can ask or think. 1 Corinthians 2.9 the Apostle Paul wrote, Eyes not seen, ears not heard, nor is it entered the heart of man. The great things that God's prepared for those who love him. But he's revealed these things to us by his Spirit, and they're coming forth to us now. In Jesus' mighty name, you are blessed. I am blessed. We are blessed. I look forward to hearing from you as you sow. I consider you a partner. And I look forward to bringing you into the family of the Dominion tribe, the Dominion company, the Dominion people. And we're going to see your life take on new course and new speed, new acceleration, new blessings because of your connection with this grace and anointing. I'll talk to you in the next broadcast. I'm Thomas Manton IV. Love you much. Be blessed.